Good morning. There, that's a good one. We are glad that you're here this morning. It is a, a special morning for us. We do have um, Jeremy Lozier and his family with us this morning um, to, uh, uh, to talk about, give us a little bit of background on himself. Um, as you know, um, he is our pastoral candidate this time. And um, so he'll be sharing with us about his background and some things this morning during this service. And then uh, at 1030, uh, we'll have a normal service and um, he'll be sharing a message with us during that time as well. Um, there'll be some time in between. Um, there's be coffee down front if you want to get that. But he'll be available to do, um, if you want to you know, introduce yourself, chat with him, um, is that. And then after the second service, um, it will be available, it'll be available from till about 1230. Um, if you want to stick after and talk to him there as well. Um, and then this afternoon at 3.30, from 3.30 to 4.30, um, if you still feel like you want to come back and talk to him and uh, maybe ask him some questions and, and, and those things, you can come back then as well. We want to give you every opportunity to be able to, um, to get to know them a little bit and, um, and go from there. We'll uh, take care of us some announcements and stuff here real quick. I um, already went through most of that. Next week... Uh, we will have a specially called business meeting at 7 p.m. And um, you see the last one there as we begin to resume normal services. Um, we'll need volunteers for Sunday school. And um, this morning we do not have any of the Sunday schools um, except do we have, no, have any of them, right? Okay, none of them are ha happening at this hour. Um, so if you do need a nursery, there is one in the basement. And... Um, uh, you can take advantage of that there. On the back side with a prayer request, I did get a call yesterday. We were here at the church and Harriet Zartman had called. And um, you, if you got the prayer chain yesterday, Mary Lou Haney, I don't know really any other details other than she had a serious stroke. And uh, to continue to pray for that, uh, for her and for um, Lynn, uh, she has to make some decisions and, and kind of uh, navigate through that. So um, pray for her. Carla, um, we got a text earlier this week that her surgery went well. Um, had, you know, they thought that they had done everything they needed to do. I think it was about a 14 hour surgery if I calculated it right. So that was, that's always so amazing to hear that your body can handle that and that doctors do that and that, you know, God just watches over all of that. So um, you look down the rest of those, continue to pray for them. There's some, some pretty serious and some pretty urgent needs on there. Um, does have, anybody have anything they need to add? We need to add to this. Yeah. Okay, yep. So uh, if you didn't hear that, Pete Zimmerman, which would be Blair's dad, is, uh, had surgery. Uh, that went well. Um, it's still going well. He was on a liquid diet. He's been off of that and now eating some, um, some soft food and, and recovering there. Had some issues with his stomach. So um, continue to pray for him, but a, a, a definitely a praise there as well. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Okay, that was Rosalind Walsh, which is Eric and Ty's um, four-year daughter. There's number three on the list. She had surgery this week, and it was, um, it was a good surgery, um, but she was just saying that they may have to go in um, soon and uh, take out her other kidney. Um, so some, some difficult times there, but uh, a praise for that um, surgery that went well there. Anyone else? Yeah, Lynn. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's pray, and then we'll invite Jeremy up, and um, we'll listen intently. Don't give him too weird of eyes, but we'll go from there. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for this day. We are thankful for this opportunity to get together. And, Lord, this is a different day, but it's a, an exciting day. And I just pray that you would be with each part of this morning. Uh, we thank you to know that you are in control of all things, and we know that you order all things and that and that you hold them all together and we thank you for that um, i just pray for um, those we talked about this morning that are on our list that aren't on our list um, lord we we know there's a lot of need and lord we we ask you for uh, we petition you there and for doctors and for health and for 
um, surgeries and, and all of these different things. But Lord, we, we thank you and we praise you for the things that, that we know you're in and that we're, uh, your hand is uh, always a part of. Lord, we thank you for the successful surgeries. We thank you for um, the healing. We thank you for all of those things that you do. And God, I just I pray for, um, again, this morning, and for those around the world who aren't able to do what we're doing here um, in the same way that we're doing it. But Lord, I, I pray that you would bless them and encourage them. Lord, that we would be faithful in praying for them. I just thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we do have Jeremy this morning. He'll be coming up and talking a little bit about his background and his family and um, whatever else he may have. What is great to be here, it's great to be in the Midwest. Uh, we're currently living in uh, Northfield, Massachusetts. It's a small little town. When I say small little town, it's a town of about 2,000 people. And then you see the, uh, the statistics on Fulton, Indiana, it's 318 people. Our family makes 322 people. So there's the, the town has expanded over the, the course of the last few days. But it is good to be here. And I'm just going to read just a portion out of Psalm 1, and uh, as we uh, talk about uh, just what God has been doing in, in our hearts and in our lives. But uh, Psalm 1 begins by saying, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Now this psalm talks about what it is to be a blessed man, a blessed individual. And as I look back on my life, I've discovered and I've seen that I am truly a blessed man. And there are ways that you can even go about becoming a blessed man. And go about ways as you follow through this psalm, talking about walketh uh, and, and not standing and, and not sitting in the seat of the scornful and how you reject negative influences and how you receive positive influences. And as the, the psalmist proclaims, to become a blessed man. And, and many times we think, well, I have this. I have a new truck. I have a new car. I have a new van. I have a new house. That's what makes me a blessed man. Well, it's really not as you, as you read through the psalm and as you see what it takes to be a blessed man. And as the, the family and the, the acquaintances that you meet, you, you realize I have so much more than what I think that I have. And I truly am a blessed individual. And as a family of, of uh, two wonderful children and uh, the, the Lord saw fit that one of our children was born into heaven. And uh, we'll, we'll show you just a little bit about uh, my family. My family, right, there we go. This is my family. We've discovered as I was trying to find pictures of, of my family, this, we don't really take a lot of pictures. How many of you take a lot of pictures of your family, of yourself? Not a lot of it. We, I have thousands of pictures of my kids, hundreds of them. I would even say more or less thousands. And so we took this picture back at Christmas time. So it's a little Christmas themed. But this is my family. I have my beautiful wife and my uh, seven-year-old son, uh, which is sitting up here. So son, you make sure you're a good boy. <laughs> Normally we sit in the back where mom can take him out, but he's right up here in front. So. But uh, I think my wife instructed... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to say Mrs. Curtis, I forget your first name, I'm sorry, to thump him, to thump him if he starts getting out of line, so good that you're sitting right next to Mrs. Curtis. Uh, but uh, my beautiful wife, my son, uh, Charlie, and our uh, youngest, Charlotte, uh, and God truly has made me a blessed man. This is my son, Charlie. I'll talk a little bit about him. He's seven, he'll be eight years old here in October, and this was the day that he received Christ as his own personal savior, and he made the Lord his. And that's my biggest prayer for all of you in this room, that under the sound of, of my voice is that you've put your faith and your personal trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's ultimately how you can become a blessed man. Uh, it's, it's hard to be blessed if you don't know the one who blesses. It's hard to be blessed if you do not have a personal walk with Jesus Christ. And this was the day that, that my son trusted Christ as his own personal savior. And uh, there's his birthday, so his birthday's coming up, and it's, we were singing happy birthday to, we had a work group at, at the camp uh, just a few weeks back, and 
so someone made, uh, her name was Claire, and made her a birthday cake, and he thought it was her, his birthday, but, so if you want to wish him a happy birthday early, he'll be tickled to death uh, over that, but, so he's, he's going into, well, he's still trying to finish up first grade, uh, and then we're, we homeschool him, and he's going into, into the second grade. And our little baby girl, this is Charlotte. If you haven't had a chance to meet her, she's a little pink fluffy thing there in the back, and uh, she kept us awake quite a bit last night. Uh, so if I slur my words a few times, it's mostly because um, she was up. And, but uh, she's a little bundle of joy, and uh, the Lord blessed us by bringing her into our family uh, on the last day of camp, get this uh, quick story. Uh, we had our last week of camp was the, the second week of August of last year, and it was one of our bigger weeks of camp. It was our teen week. And uh, so I'm working as the director over the weekend trying to get all of our staff put together, and uh, we know that uh, my wife's due date is just a few weeks away, but uh, every week she's been having a doctor's appointment, so her doctor appointment was for Monday. Our campers were supposed to come in uh, Monday afternoon. And um, getting the staff all together, and then I headed down to the doctor's appointment with my wife, and uh, they say, well, your blood pressure's too high. We're going to have to keep you here. And so, um, fortunately, her blood pressure was able to go down, so we went back home. Monday, but doctors were keeping a close eye on that. You need to make sure you, you take your blood pressure every single day. Wednesday rolled around. Blood pressure was still high. They said, you have to come in. Baby has to come now. We're right in the middle of team camp. And so uh, the craziest things were even happening that week. We had the first day of camp, we had call the ambulance twice. Uh, we're actually, we called the ambulance once with, because one of our campers, a 16-year-old camper, was having astronomically high blood pressure. And a 16-year-old shouldn't have that happen to him. Uh, unless there's something uh, conditionally wrong with him. And so uh, mom said, oh, he's fine. Well, he wasn't fine. So we called the ambulance. As the ambulance was pulling out of the camp, one of the counselors came running up to the office. So-and-so just blew out her knee playing soccer. We'll throw her in the ambulance as well. So here the ambulance is heading out. We're waving him down. Can you fit another one in the ambulance? And uh, we're, again, we're a small town, so by the time the ambulance would drive, you know, the 25 minutes to the hospital and turn back around, she was going to be in a lot of pain. So we stuffed her in the, in the side, and, and off they went. Second day, one of our, our uh, counselors, again, it's always the staff for some reason. They, they never learn. But he gashed his head wide open. And instead of telling anyone, he went to our program guy and said, hey, do you have any super glue? And so here they are performing surgery, super gluing this, uh, needed stitches, but they glued it and uh, off he went on his way. I didn't know all this. I, again, I'm, I'm concerned with my wife, concerned with, with my, my blessed family, but um, our, our blessings of staff decided to, to make a ruckus. Well, that happened on Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday, we actually went back into the hospital. Uh, they start the, the, the inducing medication and Saturday, um, uh, little Saturday morning, one o'clock in the morning, our little bundle of joy, and she hasn't slept since. So, <laughs> uh, but but anyway, and then one last thing on Friday of that same week, I got I received a, a message from our police chief and said uh, there was a a guy they arrested him and he beat up the police officer and took off and he, they were trying to book him in the office. He was handcuffed in the front, beat up the officer and the only officer in town, and uh, he went running and. Uh, there was this manhunt looking for him, and so Friday nights we always have this tradition. We uh, have a campfire and testimony time, and so I'm in the hospital waiting for our little girl to be born, and I'm getting these phone calls from our police chief. I'm trying to call our staff. <laughs> we can't do fire uh, testimony fire right now. You know we don't want to be out in the woods because it's out in the woods, uh, <clears throat> and we didn't want some convict running up on our testimony fire. So, but fortunately they caught him in time, and uh, the week ended very well. Our bundle of joy was born, and uh, it's been, been a wonderful year so far. And then <clears throat> back in 2018, our little baby girl, Rosalind uh, Sophia, she was born into heaven May 5th of, of 2018. And through this trial, the Lord allowed us to be able to have that opportunity to reach out to other people as well. See, what helped us get through was knowing the next step, striving towards the next step. Lord, what's next for us? How can we turn this tragedy into a triumph? How can we 
get through this. And if it wasn't for the Lord, that would have been, it was the most difficult uh, situation that ever happened in our family. But without the Lord, that comfort that he gave to us, allowing us to be blessed um, through that and helping us through. And we think, well, to be a blessed individual, everything has to go right 100% of the time. and, And that's not it. See, we can be blessed individuals by, number one, trusting Christ as our personal Savior. And number two, we can be a blessed man by, uh, by having that personal relationship with him, by uh, uh, reading his word, by communicating with him, by talking with him. And oftentimes we say, well, I never feel the Lord speaking to me. Well, he wrote 66 books for us. And the Lord knew that every single person in this church that were different, right? There's not a single one of us that are exactly the same. He said, well, you haven't met the Fred brothers. They're almost identical. (laughs) But we're all different. We all have our likes. We all have our dislikes. We all do our own thing. We have our hobbies, and some are into tractors, and say, well, that's, that's an expensive hobby. Some are into motorcycles. Well, that's an expensive hobby. I'm not into that. Some are into computers. Well, that's a hobby. I'm not into that. I'm into quilting. I'm into uh, wreath making. Whatever it is, we're all different. And that's fine. So the Lord chose to write 66 books for us to make sure that every one of us have something in this word for us to take with us. And we too can be blessed individuals by digging into his word. If you're ever away from your significant other for some form of time, what's the best thing to receive in the mail or to get? Um, Nowadays it's a text message. Uh, But sometimes just a personal letter can make all the difference. Just a little note that says, you know, I'm thinking about you or that um, I'm thankful that, that this happened and I'm thankful for the situation that we're going through. Or you have a friend that maybe moved across the country by sending them a card, not even on their birthday, but just out of the blue. And you get that and you, you take every word in, especially if it's handwritten. Sometimes with cards, if, if you're like me, you'll, you'll see the card and you see the the, the, what the factory printed on the card, and you think, well, yeah, that's something that I would say to them, so that's what you give to them. But sometimes you take that card, and there's a big blank space on the left-hand side, and you write them a personal note. Oftentimes when I get those cards, I'll, I'll read that personal note much more intently than I would just read just what's printed on the card itself, because you know that it was personal to you. You know that they took time to think about what they're going to say, and, well, that's our Lord. He used uh, many different people in history. He used the Apostle Paul to write some of the epistles. He used Moses to write the law. He used some of the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. And the Lord even used a wicked king, King Nebuchadnezzar, to even write some words in, in, the, in the Hebrew language. Uh, and, and he perfectly preserved them for us so that we could read them thousands of years later and that we can pull some truth from it so that we ultimately can be a blessed man. The Lord's so good to us. The Lord's been good to my family. The Lord's been good to this church uh, over the last many years to provide great leadership here. And so that's just a little bit about my family. And we're going till 10. Is that what we're going till? Or no, we don't want to go too late. Don't go past 10. (laughs) All right. That was just the introduction. I'm just kidding. Again, sticking in the book of, uh, of Psalms. Psalms, there's so much truth in it. No matter what is going about your day, no matter what's happening, there's a psalm for that. There's a verse in the book of Psalms. And this verse here is, is my life verse. I was a, a senior in college, or a senior in high school, and it was my, my 11th, 12th grade year. I wasn't really sure what God had planned for me. I was a believer. I trusted Christ. It was actually at a, at a Christian camp and uh, through the puppet ministry. And I, and I don't, if she was here today, I couldn't pick her from a lineup, but I knew her name and her name stuck with me all these years. It was the Hayes family. They were a traveling evangelistic team back in the 90s and uh, they, they had puppets and they had a puppet ministry. And so they came to the camp that, um, that my uncle started and it was, it was a small church camp. It was one week out of the year. And um, it was actually at his farm, 
<clears throat> and so we had the barn is where uh, the, the junior age would meet, and they, they actually built a, a tabernacle where they would hold their church services. And so a few, would, they, they made some dorms as well, but just, you know, block buildings and nothing else. And I'm, of course, they had a roof, and then outhouses as well. There was no indoor plumbing, nothing like that. So it was, it was a good old-fashioned camp where you think of when you go camping, you think, well, at least there's shelter over our head, and there's an outhouse. And of course, it stunk. It was just, you know, not the most pleasant thing, but Boy, it was a blast. I can remember as a, as a child just loving that one week of camp, going to camp. And uh, so there, as a young, young boy, uh, I heard the puppets talking about a man named Jesus and how he uh, came and suffered and died on the cross for our sins. And, uh, and so I, I knew that I was, I was bad. My, my mom and dad informed me of that all the time, that I did wrong things. And uh, if we're all honest with ourselves, we continue to do those things. But praise God, we have a Lord and Savior who forgives us of that if we ask. And so uh, I wasn't quite sure what she was talking about and, or what the, the puppets were talking about. So I went up to Mrs. Hayes after the puppets said, well, if you have any extra questions, come up to Mrs. Hayes and she can go through them. And there she took the Bible and she opened it up and I saw that I needed the Lord as my personal Savior. So time progressed. I, I went to a Christian school to about the seventh grade, and um, my mom and dad pulled us kids out of the out of the private school and put us into a, a public school. And my my brother graduated, my sister graduated, and uh, in high school I went to both a Votech school and and the regular school. And so, but but in that environment, uh, even though I was a believer, some of the friends that I made they weren't the best influences. Uh, some of the guys that I met, they loved to ride dirt bikes. They loved to just cause trouble. And I kind of wanted to uh, be like them. And so, believe it or not, I had a, I had a shaved, buzzed head. I mean, it was buzzed. I mean, there was, there was no hair on my head. And, uh, and so I did that really out of the spite of my dad. My dad never, I always said, I'm going to shave my head. I'm going to shave my head. And finally, I did it one day. I put a hat on. And I was heading out of the house. And he saw that you know, there was some slickness back there. He ripped my hat off. And I got in trouble, of course. So... Even through all that, my parents still loved me and prayed for me and, uh, during those rebellious uh, late teenage years. But it was actually back at that same Christian camp. It would have been the summer between my 10th and 11th um, grade year. Went back to that same camp. And um, I, I had a chance to uh, be under the preaching. And God got a hold of my heart. It was that Thursday. It was the last day of camp. And God got a hold of my, my heart and saw that I, I shouldn't be hanging around those kind of guys. I, I shouldn't. And I still remember to say it was, this, or it was a, an illustration of a Snickers bar. And for some reason, that, that changed. I, I saw that and associated, well, I love Snickers bars. And he gave the illustration and, um, that you don't want a Snickers bar that's all gross. And you want one that's, that's wrapped and, and still in good condition. And it was a weird illustration, but it stuck. And thought, well, I need to preserve myself. I need to make sure that I'm doing right, that I'm not um, causing trouble, and, and I need to get back, and I need to get right with the Lord. So I did, and still, of course, rough around the edges, of course, and it would have been my 11th grade year that uh, my English teacher went to a private school, my English teacher, Mrs. Thomas. I was still causing some problems, and I was coming down the stairs one day, and so she caught a hold of me on the stairs and said, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? I said, yeah, I do. You know, the old answer that everybody gives. Yeah, of course I know the Lord. And then she asked, well, do you remember a time and a place where you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And there I thought, well, have this whole time I've been, been just thinking about that time with the puppets, and, and I can kind of vaguely remember, but, but what, what did I really say then? Did, did it stick? Well, I'm a believer that once you're saved, you're always saved, but that was the time on those stairs where I made sure of my decision. I, as the book of, uh, of, of 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, where, where it speaks about, you know, talks about characteristics of, of a godly individual, and then it says in the latter pages, it says that he that lacketh these things is uh, and he, he forgot that he's purged from his old sins. I'm messing it up a little bit, paraphrasing. But I forgot that I was forgiven of my sins because of the lifestyle that I was living. And so at that time, I, I made reassurance of my salvation and um, decided that, you know, I'm, I'm going to put away these things. And so I finished out my high school career. Really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I thought, 
that m myself and my cousin, um, uh, Andrew, we were going to join the military together and we were just going to conquer the world together. And this was, would have been back in the early 2000s, uh, 2004 and 2005 is when I graduated from high school. And, you know, um, of course, uh, two th 2001, 9-11 uh, happened, and so we're all patriots. We just want to get out there. We want to serve our, our country, and so that's what we're going to do together. Well, he followed through with his end of the bargain, and um, I decided that maybe it's best for me to at least go to one year of Bible college uh, before I would, I would go that route. And, uh, but then I wasn't sure what I was going to study. Decided to go to Pensacola Christian College to study electrical engineering. And uh, I loved math and I loved science. And my dad was an, is an HVAC guy. And so I kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps and decided, well, what, instead of going for a trade school, I'll, I'll go to a Bible college and get an electrical engineering degree. I wanted to get out into the, into the field. I wanted to get out into the engineering field. And so from there, I went to, to PCC. And, and through, there, through the influences that uh, surrounded me, um, really, you're... I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of times you're, you are who you hang out with. You've probably heard that before. And so there I surrounded myself with good individuals. One guy's name was Jacob. Every single day we would go work out in the mornings. But before we would go work out, go hit the gym, we would uh, spend some time in the Word. And he always quoted the verse, Iron sharpeneth iron, so doth a man sharpen the countenance of his friends. And I was one of his friends, and so his, his passion was to sharpen me, to continue to make me into a useful vessel, and it was really credit to him. And so, again, I was, I was doing well in my studies, but hanging around guys like Jacob and being under the preaching every single day at, at chapel services, preachers from all over the U.S. would come and, and uh, deliver a powerful message, and um, there the Lord was softening my heart, decided... I think, I think the Lord wants me to go in the ministry. I hate speech class. I, I don't like to get up in front of people. But Lord, I think you're calling me into the ministry. How do I even do this? Uh, so I had a good conversation with my dad, and he encouraged me to do so. And so uh, 2006, I, I began um, pastoral ministries and, and uh, crammed, you know, four years of college into, into eight. And uh, I stayed on for uh, a, a master's degree as well and, and received an MDiv, and, and the purpose of, of me staying on for a master's degree was, again, my love for the military. I wanted to uh, get involved with uh, our men and women in, in uniform, and so I had a desire to be in the military chaplaincy, and so that's why I pursued the, the Master of Divinity degree and received my endorsement through Associated Gospel of Churches and was going to um, um, youth pastor for just a brief time for just two years, and then... I was going to head off into uh, um, officer training. But uh, while I was, uh, fast forward uh, those, those few years uh, through college, um, our son was born, and we decided to make the move to uh, Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, where I was a youth pastor for just under a year. And again, the whole purpose of us going to that church was uh, to just be there for just two years and then head off uh, into, for training. But while I was there, again, uh, softening my heart to what the, where the Lord was leading, I had a friend of mine from college, he, he called me up one day and said, hey, there's this camp in Northfield, Massachusetts, they're looking for a director, and I think you should apply. I've never been to New England, ever. I grew up in Pennsylvania, farthest north I ever went was Buffalo uh, to see Niagara Falls, uh, but even that's south for New Englanders, and that's, that's west, that's, that's a strange land for New Englanders. They don't ever leave New England. And so, we thought, okay, Lord, if this is what you want for us, uh, we'll, we'll at least put that out there. I was working uh, as a youth pastor, but also as a fork truck driver in a, in a factory. And I'd just be on the other end of the, the uh, factory, just, and I forgot why I was there, because I thought of Camp Northville, and that's kind of a dangerous thing to do, right? You can't be distracted with these knives sticking out of the front of your fork truck. You want to make sure that you're, you're paying attention. So Lord wouldn't leave me alone, so I, I called up uh, my youth pastor friend and said, listen, God won't leave me alone. Uh, I'm, all I'm thinking about is Camp Northfield. What do I got to do? If I at least uh, apply and if at least I submit my resume, that will clear my conscience. So I did just that and thinking that was going to be the end of it. They're, they're not going to choose me. Why would they want to choose me? I'm just a young 25-year-old kid. I don't know anything. And they did. They ended up calling us for an interview. And we 
uh, flew in. I was sharing with, with Daniel yesterday and some of the guys about our, our first New England experience. It was miserable. It was just, how many of you have ever been to New England before? In the winter time. How about in the winter time? It is, there's just, just snow. It's, that's just no other way to describe it. Just snow everywhere. And we're, we're flying, we, we leave Cincinnati, we fly to Charlotte, from Charlotte, North Carolina, we, we are supposed to land at Hartford Bradley, and you're looking out the, the window, and it's just a whiteout. And uh, it, you can feel that the plane is about to land, the, the tires are down, the flaps are out, and we're just heading down, and then all of a sudden, we just take off straight again. We're like, we're, we're so close to the ground. I think we were close. I couldn't see the amount of snow, but we're, weren't we supposed to land? And then, if any of you have ever flown before, all you heard was, and thinking, what is he saying? And so the flight attendant got on there and said, for all those who didn't hear, we're redirecting to Albany. Uh, we're going to refuel and try again. And so we land in Albany, and our son was just a wee little baby at the time. He's been up all day long, and all we want to do is crash. And... Um, not, not crash. <laughs> Wrong choice of words there. <laughs> we want to lay our heads down. And so we, we take off again out of Albany and we land again in, in, uh, in Hartford Bradley. And um, our first experience of New England was just terrible. And we had cold chili for dinner. We didn't eat all day, it seemed. And we went to a Wendy's, but they were closing. And uh, all they had left was just cold chili. They didn't even make us a hot hamburger. But um, anyway, so we, we <clears throat> left the next day to head to the camp. And uh, we just saw the charm. And just we really saw the potential, what God can really do with, uh, with those campgrounds. And um, I'm a big proponent of youth camp. I think it's, a, it's an important part, not just for our youth, but also for our men, for our ladies, for our families. If you're looking for a family camp uh, where you can just kind of grow together, a family camp environment is the place to do just that, where you're saturated with, with, uh, with, with the word of God. And, um, and so after seeing that and just seeing the potential of what God could do at a camp, uh, we just, again, fell in love with the place. And so we've been serving there for the last uh, six years, and this past off-season, God got a hold of my heart again and um, said, you've, you've done what you set out to do here at uh, Camp Northfield. It was, it was a tough situation that first year coming into it. Um, uh, there was uh, some disunity between the board and the director. The director left. Uh, the director had some, some uh, mental health issues, and so he, he left the scene and uh, really hurt a lot of people, a lot of constituents that supported the camp. And so our, our task was to rebuild the camp, was to salvage those relationships and to get the support again of, of our supporting churches and, and to do those uh, um, uh, projects that were, were quite difficult to do. And, um, and so we were to do that, kind of put a new foundation underneath the camp. We uh, set up some new core values. We, we kind of did a little bit of a rebranding with the camp. And uh, so the Lord <clears throat> used um, our board of directors. We've got a whole new set of board of directors and, and then uh, my family to, to do just that. And it, was, it was, wasn't a pleasant experience those first couple years. But as the Lord, again, being a, a blessed man, a blessing above more than we could ever ask, uh, he did the work. We kind of just sat back, buckled our seatbelts, and, okay, Lord, if this is what you want, we're in it wholeheartedly. And so we did a few projects that um, everybody said, well, that's just impossible. You might as well, there was one building, it just, even with a John Deere tractor, I know there's a big strife between Case and John Deere. I don't want to raise a hand, who's for Case and who's for John Deere? Who's for whatever works, you know? Um, but we could have taken our, our small little tractor and just pushed that building over. And, uh, and so our desire was to see that building to be restored and to uh, be used again. And so this past uh, summer um, of 2019, we were able to flush the toilet uh, for the first time in well over a decade. Uh, got new water running to it, all new plumbing. And that you say, well, that, that's not a very big deal. But for us, I mean, to, to see what this building, what kind of condition it was in, it was atrocious. And so I took a video of it and everything and put it out on our Facebook page. And I made a caption like, some of you won't think this is a big deal, 
but there's finally running water in the boys' staff building. And, and that's kind of a picture of what the Lord was able to do with us over the last seven years was we had to lift that building up. We had to put a whole new foundation underneath it. And then we had to drop it back down. It's not pretty to this day. It needs new siding. It needs new windows. Uh, it has a metal roof on it, so that's good. But at least the foundation is good. At least there's uh, new electrical in it. At least there's new plumbing. So the, the necessary things are there. Just now someone needs to paint the siding. Someone needs to paint the trim. Someone needs to replace the windows that have been broken over the years. And so different things like that is what we felt that God was, was using us at Camp Northfield to do. And then again, at the end of 2019, uh, part of my ministry as well as being a camp director was to pulpit supply. And uh, there in our area, there's not a lot of churches. The church that we're members of is about 45 to 50 minutes away. And so there's not a lot of churches in the area. And the churches that are in the area, they don't have pastors. They have just the laymen in the church trying to put together special speakers <clears throat> or trying to do it with them, themselves, small little congregation. One of the churches that we've been helping out uh, has a congregation of about 10 to 12 people. And, uh, but they they're, have a desire to keep their doors open. They have a desire to, to uh, um, have the church there in that community because it's one of the only ones. And uh, so they have a heart to do so. And so seeing that, being behind the pulpit on a weekly basis, uh, creating messages again for, for the people of God, um, the Lord got a hold of my heart and, and uh, I, I said, Lord, we need more preachers. We need more pastors in the U.S. I mean, Lord, look at all these churches here in this area that were without pastors. Lord, help me find pastors to be able to, to put in these churches. And then he said, well, why don't you do it? I said, Lord... I'm fine as a camp director. Lord, this is becoming easy to me. Lord, it's, I'm putting together a staff every summer. I, I invest in them. I love them. I pray for them. Lord, why can't I just continue to do this? And then uh, the Lord, again, just kept softening my heart, just like how he did in 2013 with, with Camp Northfield. He did that again for me this past year and said, there's churches all over the U.S. that, that need pastors. There's, there's pastors retiring. There's pastors leaving the field. There's missionaries leaving the field. Um, we need more men out there to lead these churches. And so that's what we started doing. And then uh, Bruce shared with you all back in January, uh, a friend of mine that I met uh, back in 2014, John Bate, he put a little, little blip on Facebook and he said, there's a great church in Fulton, Indiana. They're looking for a pastor, pastor retiring, and um, just looking for a young pastor. And I saw that and just kind of ignored it, but just, just saw it real quickly. I thought, okay, there's, Lord, there's another church in need. Lord, we need more pastors. We need more men out there. And um, so all I did was, I, I think I put in the comments, John, how far away is that church from you? And he said, just a couple hours. And um, again, just like in, in 2013, I just kept thinking about Fulton Baptist Temple. And uh, so John reached back out to me and said, hey, I know some of the guys over there. Why don't you send me your resume? Why don't you send me your, your uh, doctrinal statement? And I'll, I'll send it their way. And I said, okay. And uh, again, just had that faith and that trust. Lord, you know what you're doing. So I sent it that way. And it wasn't a few weeks later, uh, Daniel emailed me and said, hey, uh, would you like to have a FaceTime conversation? And so I said, certainly. So I looked up uh, you all and I, I looked at your, your policies. I looked at your doctrinal statement. And uh, again, we're just, we're just, we're here for you. We're here to love you. We're here to, to care for you. We're here to pray for you. And wherever we see this relationship going, uh, we're in it 100%. And so just to the conversation that we had, um, you know, our, we, we line up as far as um, uh, practically and philosophically and, and, and doctrinally. And so we'll just see where, where this relationship is going. We had a wonderful time yesterday uh, over at the... Um, a McGrew, McGrew household, and so Charlie had a great time swimming, and he looks exhausted today as a result of it, but uh, we had a good time nonetheless, and, and, um, and we really appreciate the Midwest culture. See, in New England, you're at a, fan, you're at a friendly Walmart if you don't get cussed at, uh, so <laughs> nobody says hi to you, uh, nobody waves to you. Um, uh, it was our first night here. We, we pulled into the Airbnb that were over there, and thank you again for such wonderful accommodations. Um, and, but uh, the first night we were there, uh, we get, had a knock on the doors about eight o'clock in the, in the evening and 
course, the it, it, sun doesn't set here till about like 9.30, which is wonderful. Uh, see, up in, way up in the northern hemisphere, the uh, sun comes up about 5.30, but uh, even in the summertime, it sets about 8.30 or so, and, and then in the wintertime, it sets at like 4.30. So there's just, no wonder people up in New England are so miserable. <laughs> it's, it's never light out. And if it is light out, it's snow. And that's because the reflection of the moon off the snow. But um, anyway, there was a, a knock on our door. It was like 8 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking, are the police here? Who even knows we're here? And uh, again, we're not used to that. See, when we lived four years down south, and then we lived in Kentucky, everybody's always so friendly, and they just love you to death. Uh, but up in New England, again, it's, it's you know, the, the stereotypical, I hope there's nobody from New England I'm offending. <laughs> As I'm, so anybody from New England before I continue. Now, we, again, we, 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 we've learned to love the people, we learned to love the culture, and, uh, but that, that wasn't really uh, what we were used to growing up. And uh, anyway, Dave and Linda, Dave and Linda, you here this morning? Yes, there they are. But, uh, but we really appreciate that, that visit and uh, just the love that you showed for just a few minutes that we had a chance to talk to you all. And uh, so it was a great time. And so uh, we, we just love the Midwest culture. And we love the, the, the hospitality that you've all been showing to us so far. And, um, and again, we're just going to pray that uh, as the Lord sees fit, we'll, we'll pray for the, the best for your church and uh, to see if this is a compatible fit. But that's just a little bit about my family. Uh, again, close with this verse, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Uh, that was a verse that I adapted as my life verse back uh, when I was a senior, a junior, and a senior in, in high school, and kind of just been living my life with that philosophy that uh, I'm here to please the Lord. I'm here to love people. And, you know, as uh, different restrictions come down on us, you know, our local board of health said that we can't open camp this summer, uh, but what, that's not going to stop us from getting the gospel out there. So what did we do? We established something called Camp Quarantine. And uh, so we had these virtual lessons and the gospel continued to go out. And then even your church, you adapted to that. Uh, we're not going to let uh, man stop us from getting the gospel message out there. And so that's been, again, my life's philosophy. I've been trying to abide by that and then just trying to be pliable. And uh, two words that I've taken to and adapted to my ministry is to be flexible and to be balanced. If we can be flexible in our ministry and know that uh, this individual may want to do things this way and this individual wants to do things this way. Okay, let's, let's come up with a, let's be flexible about it. You know, a service is supposed to start at 9.15. If it starts at 9.17, it's not the biggest deal in the world. We're having fun communicating with one another. Let's be flexible. Uh, and so that's been one of the words that I've adapted into my ministry. And then balance, to be balanced. Uh, to take the word of, words of God, to take the truth that he has. But uh, there's a verse that says, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. It's important for us to speak the truth. Uh, we have to say, thus saith the Lord. The Lord says this. This is, this is what God has for us. This is right and this is wrong. Thus saith the Lord. That's truth. But we must speak the truth in love. We must have that caring attitude about us. Because if we're speaking the truth without any love... That's brutality. However, if we're speaking only love and no truth, that's hypocrisy. We have to have both. We have to be balanced in our ministry, and we have to be flexible in our ministry. Again, thank you, church, for hearing my, my spiel the last uh, 45 minutes or so, and looking forward to getting to know you all just a little bit uh, better. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to come up and, and be glad to talk to you and um, just sh share with you what, what God's doing in our hearts and in our life. But um, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll turn it back over to you, brother. Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the leadership that's found here. We thank you for the, the truth that has been preached behind this pulpit over the last many, many uh, years. And Father, we pray for the future of this ministry. We pray that the gospel message will continue to go out from here, not just from this pulpit, but as the live streams are happening, as uh, people are tuning in in their homes or wherever they may be tuning in, I pray that they'll hear that gospel and that they'll ultimately turn to you if they have not already. And in that, Lord, you tell us that you came to give us life, but you also came to give us life more abundantly that we can live a joyful and a happy and a, uh, and a glorious life here on this earth while the, the years that we have remaining here. And 
Father, that we'll do that, not for us, not to please ourselves, but ultimately, Lord, to please you and to give you the glory, to give you the praise. Father, we ask for your blessing upon the remainder of this service. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.